everybody Turn this up in my headphones, Charles Turning it up Hello, 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 everybody, one and all. Welcome to yet another very exciting episode of the Friends Talking Fantasy Podcast. My name is Charles, and with me today, as always, is my lifelong friend and co-host, Dylan. I'm ready to talk some fantasy with my friend, Charles. I'm ready to talk some fantasy with my friend as well, Dylan, and not just any fantasy, mind you. Today is a is a big day for the Friends Talking Fantasy Podcast. It's today that we are finally reading work from uh, Lord Grimdark himself, Joe Abercrombie. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> this one has been the works for a while now. I think this might be the most talked about about series on our podcast that's never gotten an episode solely dedicated to it. Would you say that's probably true, Charles? I would say that's probably true. Um, You know, Abercrombie is obviously a a huge inspiration for both of us, and we bring him up all the time in our various character series and things like that. And, you know, it's almost an inevitability that we're here. It's like, well, we're definitely going to read this book. It's just kind of a matter of when, and when is today. Right. Once you got a task to do, it's better to do it than live with the fear of it, Charles. (laughs) It's time to do it. It's very well said. So today we're entering the first Law Trilogy, uh, Joe Abercrombie's uh, first work, and uh, we're starting with book one, The Blade Itself. Right. And... You know, oh, say one thing for Joe Abercrombie. Charles, uh, say he writes some amazing characters. So I think that probably the best way for us to focus this when we do get into it is to center our discussion more around the characters than the plot, because we know for sure the blade itself centers far more around the characters than it does around the plot. So <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yes, that's very I say true. that with the most love possible. And uh, <laughs> so we are going to be talking about, uh, the events of the blade itself without regard for uh, like not saying spoilers for this particular book Um, we won't although Charles and I have both uh, read this series multiple times at this point or at least we've both read the book multiple times Mm -hmm. we won't be going beyond the blade itself Mm -hmm. Uh, So if you've only read that first one, then you should be all good in this episode. But if you haven't read The Blade itself yet, well, time to get on it. I mean, (laughs) uh, this is one of the modern classics of fantasy and an incredible novel. But if you haven't, then you might want to turn this down in your headphones right about now because we will be spoiling The Blade itself very well said. So let's get right into the story here. The We open with none other than Logan Nine Fingers himself in the midst right. of an attack from the Shenka. You got to watch out for those flatheads. <laughs> you got to watch out for those flatheads. And what's interesting about Logan right away is he's being... Um, First of all, the action is is always good to start off in an exciting uh, fashion. And uh, what's more exciting than jumping off like a huge waterfall while escaping like a bizarre creature like human like monsters? Right. I mean, that's one thing that I really appreciate about Abercrombie's work is he throws you right in there. They say Mm -hmm. a uh, start late and end early when it comes to writing a good story and and Abercrombie throws you right in there, but he never gives you anything that's too difficult to understand right at the start. He just throws us right into, hey, I'm fighting for my life here. I'm trying to survive. Uh, I think we get some good Logan still alive drops (laughs) at some point, (laughs) probably during this chapter, (laughs) and and we'll get many more. (laughs) So, yeah, we can all pretty quickly jump into the head of a character who's fighting for his life against uh, these little shank up monsters, and it's a fun action scene. It's a lot of fun, you know. You've he's he's um 
the stakes are pretty high. We didn't, he, we're not quite sure who this guy is. We know he's suffering a bad injury in his leg. We know he's um, lost, separated from his comrades. And then when the action is all done, we, he finds himself alone, and he's kind of puzzling out what's, uh, what to do. And you get a sense that Logan's a guy who's uh, been through this quite a few times, and he uh, knows how to get right to business and figure out what to do and just get right to it and... He knows that the only way to survive is to just uh, keep moving, pick a direction and and go. <laughs> He's gauging how much food he has, how much water he has, all these things. And it's um, it's right away. Th- this is a great example of showing over telling, right? Because all these things are happening and you're getting a good sense that Logan's this experienced traveler, hardened warrior. And you're getting that right away in the first chapter of this book. That you do. I think we had a conversation back when we were on Phantology podcast or talking about how, uh, you know, in Lord of the Rings, if someone, let's imagine someone got separated from a group of people in Lord of the Rings, it won't spoil anything. (laughs) But (laughs) that Lord of the Rings, those Lord of the Rings spoilers. Um, (laughs) So imagine that happens. They're probably going to go look for them because they're part of the group. But pretty early on, we're acquainted with what kind of story Joe Abercrombie is going to tell, which is one where if you're a hardened warrior and you get separated from your group, you have no idea where they are in the middle of nowhere, and you just gotten attacked by flatheads, then it's like, okay, well, they're dead. Time to <laughs> move on with my life. And of course, we find out later that the dog man and his crew are still kicking for sure. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> they think Logan's dead and they've moved on and Logan thinks they're dead and he's ready to move on. So, right. But you still move get, on. We do. You, but it's interestingly juxtaposed in these early moments with one of my, <laughs> one of my favorite kind of relationships is Logan with his, uh, his cook pot. <laughs> right. He, he does have these moments of sentimentality where he, he wrote off his crew because he's like, well, obviously they're dead and I have to move on. And that might seem cold and callous, but it's kind of the reality. He's gonna die, like Logan's gonna die if he tries to look for them, and especially since they're probably dead. But he's he's also lamenting about his cook pot that he's had with him through all these adventures, and he tries his best to hold on to it. And then his situation gets um, severe enough that he had to leave the poor cook pot behind. Right, and if I'm remembering correctly, Charles, he leaves the cook pot so he can carry Malachus quad. Yes, exactly. And- so that's a great scene exactly and i think it's really interesting you know logan has all these uh, sayings right these axioms that are he got from his father and i've been trying to work some in when i can already Mm -hmm. Uh, and what uh, my favorite probably is you have to be realistic about these things (laughs) and i think that saying plays a very important role throughout this story that we'll get into I think over and over again as we continue our buddy read I'm sure we'll be talking about Logan Sayings a lot but what's interesting is to track some of when Logan listens to the voice in his you know the voice that's saying you have to be realistic about these things and when he doesn't because that Malchus Kwai decision is like okay well I've got to I've got to move on. I have to if I'm going to go with this guy who can't walk anymore, he's an apprentice to Bias for any who haven't read the series for a while and he's mm-hmm. met Logan out in the middle of nowhere. He's trying to take him to where Bias, the first of Magi is and Kwai is not a rugged outdoorsman like no, Logan and he's quite the kind of struggling. Right. And Logan Rouse says, I'm going to have to carry this guy. I think it's 40 miles if I'm going to be able to Save get him. to, yeah, get to where I need to go here. Mm-hmm. And he's just dead weight. But Logan, he's a complex guy. He's a kind of guy who the, you have to be realistic about things will cause him to use his spirit powers, which, uh, kind of seem to come out of nowhere <laughs> or to <laughs> breathe fire in people's faces and kill them and things like that. But he's also then like 
pondering, hey, should I carry Malchus Kwai or not? And he goes through this like, look, I've left people behind before. It happens and all this kind of stuff. And he does think you have to be realistic about these things. But uh, the comrade right. he and ends up also leaving like, behind like, actually has, is a pot. Yeah, poor pot. Yeah, which is too. He's yeah. He he keeps going back, and he's like, "Oh yeah, I've seen every instance of how this plays out throughout my experience as like a traveler and a warrior." And Malchus Kwai has proven himself to be worthless (laughs) in in pretty much every sense. At least in yeah, at least in this journeying through the wilderness respect. Right, exactly. So you think like Abercrombie's building it up like Logan is making this decision to leave Kwai behind and that's what you truly believe is that, well, man, he's not doing well, he's sick, he's like we have 40 miles, all this other stuff, Uh, best to be realistic about these things and then what happens? He hauls him over his shoulder, uh, gives him a little bit of water, and, and starts going. And he looks over his shoulder and is like, so long, pot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is a, right. a great moment. And it's a, it's especially, I think, a great moment because you get this moment. I, I mean, you've got in Logan as a, we'll use the word pragmatic because we use it so much on this podcast you've got him as this yeah. pragmatic seasoned warrior who knows when it's time to let go of something already because of the scenes you've had up to this point with logan mm-hmm. and this helps round out his character so well because logan is such a he's maybe my favorite character in the whole genre and he is such a nuanced and complex character and you're stuck very close with his musings in his head uh, throughout like you get there's full chapters in here that feel like they're just logan musing about his past but because it's written with that amazing joe abercrombie voice through an amazing joe abercrombie character it's like all very interesting and enjoyable to read and you get logan thinking about like look i'm like i've got the bloodiest hands of anyone in the north like my history in a place where everyone's killing everyone constantly it's always war there's no one worse than me and (laughs) at the same time he's the kind of guy who's you can tell at least trying to take steps at this point to turn his life around and be a little bit better and i think it's something that people including myself end up latching on to logan and thinking like this guy's actually a pretty good guy no matter how many times he tells you i'm a killer i have killed more people than anyone yeah yeah say one thing about joe abercrombie say that he is uh, excellent at going like analyzing a character through their own perspective right you're so in this character's voice and every character has such a unique voice and logan's perspective he is this philosopher type but he also grew up as just like a base to oversimplify it a barbarian warrior right so it's this it's this idea that he's got these sensitive philosophical mindset but all he knows is blood and war Mm -hmm. and he's at the point where we meet him in the book, he's realized that it's brought him nothing but like horrible, <laughs> like a, a horrible misfortune. And he's, he's realizing he has to do better. So he's taking his experience. And now that he's older and more experienced and maybe more tired and maybe not as driven, he's trying to find a place in life. And he's trying to like adjust to being more sensitive and helping people out. And he's going to new places and he's kind of got this like, fish out of water moments in the city and he's trying to understand and be like i guess kind of build relationships with new people and he's applying everything that he's learned out like in the north in a more quote civilized city and it's those kind of musings that he has and the way the characters in the city react to him that add to his voice and it's all through this committed perspective of what would this barbarian trying to change his ways think and say and do and how would you if you take him to a totally new environment how would he react and he's one of the more progressive people i'd say surprisingly in those early moments in the city (laughs) he is charles i i think some of it is just he's not caught up in the stuffiness of it all like he sees people as 
people and and he's grown from a place where they're so focused on just surviving that he doesn't have time to worry about like all this crap that the people in uh, the Union. the city are in the agriant are out there like worrying about with prejudice and discrimination all this kind of stuff like logan is a little bit more like look like i I don't have time for all these formal structures and it does make him compared to some, it's a pretty low bar (laughs) that you're comparing him to (laughs) in Agriot, but you are dealing with someone who's a little more open than some of these others. And, and Charles, I do want to say, maybe you have more here that we can get Mm -hmm. back to. I do want to say probably the, (laughs) you mentioned that how good Joe Abercrombie is at like having characters like muse about themselves through their own perspective or view yeah. the world through their own perspective. And I think yeah. that's only matched by how he has other characters yes. then view his oh, char- yeah. like his other point of view characters, if yeah. that makes sense. So what I'm thinking about is like uh, what he does such a great job of building the character of Logan in part by showing like, here's how Giselle Den Luther as like a really spoiled pramp, pampered uh, dude growing up in uh, the middle of the union uh, would see Logan. So he sees him as just like this, uh, this barbarian, this savage, he like <laughs> from when you're in Giselle's perspective, the description of Logan is like looked in his eyes and it's like had as much uh, like thought going on behind them as an animal. <laughs> it's like he just sees this guy. He's like there. This is no more than a an animal or anything like that. Well, then you've got someone like Superior Glockta who has more of a gift for detecting more subtle things like and Glockta sees Logan as this guy appears as a barbarian but there's a lot going on behind those eyes there's a Mm. lot to deal with there and Glockta (laughs) sees him as actually being pretty clever just not acting like it. And it's funny because Glockta always describes Logan as like not paying attention to the conversation. He's like distracted in thought, which we can almost kind of understand that because all of Logan's perspective is him like thinking about stuff. So when Glockta's like, and then there was the big guy and he was just like staring at something, thinking about it for, and you're like, oh, it's kind of funny to think of Logan that way of like, while he's doing that, he's just standing there. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. That is funny. Yeah, and there's great moments. It's like, you know the character so well that by the point, I think at one point Glockta makes a joke that uh, it's like they run into this sort of spirity feeling thing that I won't get into any details around, but it's cold and uh, this voice that seems to look like Logan's dead wife is uh, interacting with Logan. And Glockta makes a joke where he's like... uh, or is it Glock? I think it's Baez. Uh, Baez makes a joke where he's like, I don't know, maybe it crawled up the latrine pipe or sewage or, or oh, pipe, yeah. I guess it was. And uh, you know from earlier, like Logan has just learned about pipes. Yeah. And he's like, and you're in Glockta's perspective. And when Baez makes the joke about pipes, it, Logan's like, <gasps> like he's sh- very scared by the idea that like, oh, is this something that then a spirit a dangerous spirit could crawl through and hurt us. It's like, uh, so I also it's read it funny as you were surprised someone... to learn that the pipes were full of um, <laughs> people's oh. body movements. I think he was horrified to think that within the pipes is everyone like going to the bathroom and he's staring at it like, Oh, that's this possible. is used for the bathroom. Like that's how I read it. Like, cause he's, oh. cause up to that moment he was like, you can't find anywhere to go to the bathroom. And he was thinking about peeing in a potted plant. And he's like, what are all <laughs> these pipes? And then I think like when Baez made the joke about latrine pipes, he had this, horrifying moment of like wait so all of the like pee goes through all these pipes and he's uh, like i didn't even out. think of that that's what i assumed it was <laughs> and it's so glock is describing he's like he's he has wide eyes and he's staring at the pipes that's <laughs> yeah now nah, i mean it's it's so cool how abercrombie is able to 
do a job of developing multiple characters at once using mm-hmm. perspective. That's something that sticks out because it's like uh, when when you're hearing how Giselle views Logan, yeah, you're learning about Logan, how he'd be pers- perceived by someone who comes from the kind of background as Giselle, but you're also learning about Giselle that it's like, yeah, this guy is so superficial he cannot see past like the way this guy (laughs) this other guy is dressed and what he like the fact that his face is scarred up so uh, yeah i think those kind of things build character in a way that you you just don't see in too many books right i mean we've seen in a lot of other kinds of fantasy stories, this idea of like putting someone who's more like lived out in the wilderness confronting a city and we get these like, oh, you city folk are disconnected from nature. You know, like we, we've we gotten that kind of trope before. But what makes it interesting with Jezel is that Jezel is like so bought into his own ideas and um Logan's so bought into his and their characters are so honest that when they come together, they come together not in this way of like their budding ideals. It's just like they're trying to tolerate each other and understand each other and they have the wrong idea about each other so often. And the only way we know that is because we've been in their heads and we've also seen their first impressions of the other character and how, how kind of wrong they are or how funny and honest they are at times. And it's just so, it's funny. It's funny without telling any jokes to read and see like how Giselle perceives Logan and Baez and how Glockta sees Logan, <laughs> you know? It's like, it's like, wow, we know these characters and we know that that's like kind of funny how it's either wrong or it hits on something a little too true. You know, it, it, it's... It's um, really a unique experience to to reading Job or Crombie is how these uh, characters play out both as they're perceived and as they think. For sure, Charles. I think you're talking about Giselle over here, and I I've read the series a few times now. I I think this might be my fourth read of this book. Right. Uh, it's <laughs> at least my third, and. Uh, but you can never have too many rereads of Joe Abercrombie's novels, Charles. I and, believe it. <laughs> yeah. And I think Giselle... So first off, I, I think the, the obvious ones, right, as the maybe the best characters in this series, Logan Nine Fingers, as we've been talking about, and then Sandin Glockta, who we'll yeah. certainly get into in great detail in this episode. Uh, and they definitely receive the most attention uh, online or wherever you go in the fantasy communities. But I really do think that Giselle Den Luther is the most underrated character in <laughs> this series and it's because it's like on your first read you're like this guy is so unlikable it's like why is the torturer and the like ruthless barbarian killer why are they so much more likable (laughs) than this guy who's like never killed anyone as far as we know like never really hurt anyone but he's just such a like self-obsessed jerk <laughs> i mean <laughs> it's yeah, like he's quite the snob get over your, <laughs> right snob get over yourself yeah. <laughs> so narcissistic i mean uh, and the thing is after you've read through it a, a couple times you're kind of just taking a look at like okay what is this character you know where they're going those kind of things and you're not as like just especially the first time around, you're maybe like trying to find a character that seems like a like nice enough or good enough person right. where you're like, this is who I root for. Like these guys are all interesting, but I'm looking for the one I root for. And maybe Giselle <laughs> on the outside seems like he fits an archetype of the like a a young character training for greatness, uh, like a noble man. <laughs> yeah. All these yeah. things that maybe could be the character that would be like the hero in a lot of these stories. And he's so distasteful, but it's so <laughs> deliberate from Abercrombie, the ways that he's distasteful. And I think his perspective, I find myself laughing so much, maybe more than anyone, any other chapter when I'm reading Giselle Den Luther chapters. Yeah. And it's interesting that you say, how can he be so much more unlikable? And I think that's speaks to how important these internal musings are with each character. What's interesting about the union and about the city is 
that it's written as I guess the best word is like stagnant in that they've kind of they're in civilization and anything outside is like beneath them. There's very clear classism between nobles and they've gotten so comfortable in their way of life that they are kind of self-absorbed and they don't have the experience that totally juxtaposed against Logan, who's like been fighting to survive. And he, you know, he doesn't have these things we were talking about, like prejudice and stuff like that. And yes, he's maybe killed a lot of people and maybe Glock to tortures a lot of people, but Giselle is just so unsavory and how we're so familiar with this person in our lives. Like, Oh, this snobby, spoil privileged, you know, everything right. you love to hate about, about a human being. And and then you see the other characters also kind of love to slam dunk on him all the time. And like, <laughs> says he has no experience and he's like, what's wrong with you guys are the weirdos. Like I'm over here living my life and, like like as a noble son and i'm doing everything right like i won i won the tournament you haven't done anything bias <laughs> like, you know so it's like it's like why is bias like in my way can you see i'm i'm celebrating my victory right now <laughs> like you know those kind of moments and that's what makes giselle perhaps one of the best written characters in terms of like what you get from outside of his perspective like logan and glock have the best phrasings and musings but like to see how off base Chazal is on so many things <laughs> because of the product of his environment is right. so amazing and rewarding. And I can see that on the reread getting more and more appreciated because he is so well written in that respect. Oh yeah. It's so, I mean, you used the word narcissist before mm -hmm. Charles. And I think that's pretty apt for describing. I mean, there's a scene he's looking in the mirror and admiring his chin and talking about how perfect it is. <laughs> Yeah, we get a lot of chin musings, and a, it's like reflections on, like, has there ever been such a noble <laughs> jawline before, Charles? Yeah. And I think the, the I wrote down in my notes as I was reading through this, uh, I wrote down the word narcissist to describe Giselle when he's, uh, when he's first going to go meet Artie, and uh, that's West's sister, call him West's sister, Artie, yeah. uh, for the listeners, uh, if it's been a little while. And uh, he arrives at the door, and he hears shouting on the inside. And, you know, any normal person would be like, oh, no, like, are they fighting? Like, worried about what's going on on the inside? And Or maybe they're like, hmm. Like, I want, I'm curious what's happening. I want to know. Like, all these kind of things, maybe a little bit more of a normal person's reaction to this thing. Right. And Giselle is such a narcissist that there's this line where he he stood guiltily in the corridor, his ear drawing closer and closer to the wood, hoping to hear something complimentary about himself. <laughs> <laughs> like, he's literally like, these people are shouting, ooh, like, it might be about me, and maybe they'll say something nice about me. Like, who wouldn't just go ahead and say something nice about me right now when they're <laughs> shouting at each other? That's an amazing moment. I love that. Yeah, when he first is dealing with Artie is so good. And when he can't understand his feelings for Artie is also so funny. It's like, but she's not like noble born. She's like, I can't be seen with her. Like, oh, maybe I can like see her in secret. You know, he's trying to like puzzle all these things together. And then it's like, how dare she uh, makes has makes me fall in love with her you know he's going through all these like amazing <laughs> amazing moments so it's like wow you are such a little snob <laughs> so charles can we also say that giselle goes through the most character growth in the blade itself in terms of because he's actually by the end of the blade itself like he <laughs> He hasn't gone to a point where we're really, uh, if we take a step back and just look at where he's at, we're not impressed, but we're yeah. still like, from where you started, the fact that by the end, he's like, well, I really couldn't have an arrangement where she's just like my mistress because that would, or like I just, uh, uh, it, where I have some sort of intimate relationship with her, her or where it's basically only serving me <laughs> like right. because that would be bad for her right and his sheer realization that an arrangement that's only good for him and bad for someone else would probably not be a good thing to do <laughs> is a lot of character growth from where he started 
that's fair you know i i wouldn't i don't think of character growth when i think of this book but my like, glotto went through some but yeah, i think you're right about jazal because there's also there's also the moments where he's with his friends and they're all drunk and he's like competing in the championship and he's like well you know this is actually it like my friends are actually kind of annoying <laughs> and all this drinking and gambling <laughs> that they're doing is kind of annoying, which is exactly what he was doing when we first met him. So there's some growth there as well. And he says he, he professes his love for Artie, which is also a big um, character growth thing for him to profess his love to someone with common blood. It's kind of a big deal. So yeah, I could, I, I w- I'm down with that. Just almost improved. Right. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> there's a lot that we'll get into around how Joe Abercrombie views character arcs and growth and, and things like that, that I think we'll have even more interesting conversations about as we keep moving through this trilogy and beyond. But I do think that it, it, it there is noticeable growth for Giselle. He just had so far to go to be anything resembling or like a reasonable person who considers <laughs> other people's feelings that he he actually goes through a decent amount in this one to get there at least and it it is interesting when he figures out why he is so interested in Artie Charles I always yeah. thought that was such a oh yes it's such that's a cool an character interesting moment. moment right because it, it I forget the exact line, but it was something like because she was like different and made him feel like he wasn't the most noble guy in the room. You know, she kind of took him down a few pegs that made him like attracted to her. Like this idea that he had to earn his privilege with her was something very attractive to Jazal because Jazal's the character that's been given everything. And the fact that he's earned her love is like the first thing he's probably ever earned in his whole life and he's um just enamored with her for that reason and that was a really interesting um like deep psychology thing for for Giselle to kind of realize and uh Abercrombie has a background in psychology right so there's a little bit of I that I believe in there that's as well. what his like college degree is in mm-hmm. so is in yeah. psychology um yeah I I think it's even a step farther than that where it's basically Giselle realizes that she not only does she not like fall head over heels for him right away because he has a great jawline but (laughs) she basically seems to hold contempt for him and he kind of deep down is somehow aware enough to figure out like he's a contemptible person (laughs) like he's not like I, I wish I was able. I'm gonna uh, keep looking a little bit on my Kindle highlights here because I think I would have highlighted it. But he basically knows at some level he's like he's not a person that anyone has any reason to like for anything but superficial means, and the fact that Artie treats him that way instead of treating him like he is a person to be adored uh, like you were saying Charles makes him feel like oh I I actually have to go like not be a horrible person Um, right so and there's also this idea of like because yeah because she very clearly doesn't care about his station or his looks or anything like that the fact that she does start to open up to him makes him feel a deeper connection as well it's like oh she doesn't like me because I've like I'm winning the fencing tournament or because of my perfect jaw or because of my noble birth or whatever. So that's another piece of it. Right. Although I think the more I read this more, it's very clear. I think that Artie's basically hanging out with Giselle because she is so lonely and bored. Yeah. (laughs) And no one's giving her any attention, especially um, her brother. Right, Colm West is, there's a lot there, but he is basically ignoring her while he is looking to advance his own place among nobles, because he's a commoner himself, and it's a very difficult, 
it's very difficult to make your way in that world when you're a commoner in the mm-hmm. Agriont. Absolutely. And I guess Chazal is like this guy that, like, one, is paying attention to her, and two, that is someone she can, like, you know, converse with and it's like oh he's just like a stupid guy like i can i can like talk circles around him he's kind of interesting to like speak to and that and you know things like that so i think in in some way she sees something total and that and west does not want them to be together and i think that's also a huge piece of it (laughs) as well it's like west's worst nightmare and she's like ooh, this is perfect (laughs) why did this all just become that much more interesting (laughs) so yeah (laughs) yeah that's a good point there's definitely a piece to it of getting back at west who she holds some i think more than anything she's she's trying to get his attention she's trying to get west's attention trying to get his attention is probably fair charles yeah uh and she's very frustrated with him throughout because she kind of had some high hopes that she would come to agriot and he would show her around take care of her and yeah. take care of her and interact with her and actually she would not be bored all the time and mm-hmm. she uh, doesn't get that she's probably more bored than ever because right. she doesn't know anyone and at least Giselle is hanging out with her and like you said uh nothing gets her brother more annoyed than right. her hanging there's out there's also with the like all the excessive drinking as well as could be could, one of the reasons could be can, that's could be considered that it's a way of acting out kind of another is that she's probably an alcoholic (laughs) but like it's one of those things where it's like oh welcome home brother i'm like super drunk doesn't that make you like crazy (laughs) go kind of moments that we got um and i don't know if we're ready to get into those moments but that's some of my favorite dialogue in the whole book it just stands out above the rest of the book i was like surprised i was like whoa like this is where we get the, the best Artie dialogue is the Artie west conversations like oh that was Artie, surprising. yeah Artie's dialogue is i think some of the best written in the book because she's got i think she has a very dry sense of humor and she's always making these witty remarks and uh that's you know who has a dry sense of humor and always makes witty remarks <laughs> Joe Abercrombie. <laughs> so I think it's very easy for him to write that voice and it comes through. So she has great dialogue and her interactions with Colm speak to a history there that obviously feels like a brother and sister relationship that started way, way before this book was ever written. So credit to Abercrombie for being able to write that. And and while we're still on Giselle, mm-hmm. uh, and maybe we'll shift after <laughs> some of this, there's a, a great line uh, <laughs> where Colm's reflecting on how Giselle is kind of, it's to be expected that Giselle would let him down because he's <laughs> such a contemptible person. Yeah. Uh, and uh, there's a line that starts with Giselle would let him down and badly. And it goes on to say, a, <laughs> but it was hardly that shocking. Uh, the man was an ass. You keep your wine in a paper bag. You shouldn't be too upset when it leaks. <laughs> so. Yeah. And I love when he wins the contest and Gorse is like congratulating him. And so he's like, why is this guy talking to me? I just won. Like, how soon can yeah. I get away from him? And, you know, like, he's so ready to accept that he won fair and square even though it was obviously <laughs> some kind of weird magical force took over but he's so narcissistic that he believes he's won and then he's like why are all these people at my dinner like why do i have the unfortunate luck to sit next to some of these weirdos <laughs> and then like why can't people why are all these people trying to congratulate me i'm just trying to like go on like why would you talk to me you lost loser go away <laughs> you know like all those oh, so fun moments that you know he didn't earn but he totally believes that he does and as the reader just the experience of reading Giselle is amazing I think so too and and maybe the only person who's actually suspicious of mm. Giselle outside the people who actually directly know that he had magical aid is none other than Sandin Glockta Sandin Glockta suspicion yeah, itself and, <laughs> exactly. Always asking questions, that one. <laughs> and so Sandin Glockta, obviously, he's a, a torturer who at one point was, it sounds like, 
a lot more like Jazal than he'd like to believe, <laughs> or he yeah. probably is very well aware of how much like Jazal he was, but a lot more yes. like Jazal than he would like uh, when he was the shining star of the Agriant and he was mm-hmm. uh, the person who had just won the contest and he went off to uh, war with the Gurkish. He was captured and then tortured. This all is this all predates the book. Uh, Although I, I will say, Charles, a little drop for sh- the Sharp End short story book. Uh, it does have a short story where you get to see Sandin Glockta when he was oh. the master swordsman and all this kind of stuff. That's funny. Uh, and <laughs> about to, yeah, and West is in it. And uh, he's about to head off to fight the Gurkish. So right before he gets captured. And uh, I think the perspective character in that one is Salem Ruse. So oh, <laughs> very... Salem Ruse. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, he comes up a couple times. <laughs> Ruse, is, yeah, Ruse is always in the mix. Yeah. So anyway, I think... Definitely worth checking that one out. Uh, and I do think it'd be nice for us to cover sharp ends on the show at some point. But <laughs> we <laughs> we do meet Glockta way after he's been tortured. And now he's kind of living out this weird life where <laughs> he's been tortured so much himself that it's made him very well equipped to torture other people. Mm-hmm. And that's how he makes his living. That's right. And he's an inquisitor. He's asking questions and trying to find out answers. That's right. He's proven to be a pretty sharp mind, and it's interesting to juxtapose his torturing with his reflection on how he was tortured and how, like, he has the crick in his neck that hurts when he's, like, cutting into somebody, you know? It was like um, how it's like you would you would think that someone who was tortured would probably shy be be a little too uh, triggered by torturing, but he's he goes into it and he's exceptionally good at it. And to hear his musings about like, oh, this is the point where they do this. It's like, oh, we're getting to this step already, or wow, this guy's surprisingly resilient. You know, like he's so familiar with the procedural aspect of torturing, and you get that from like his inner musings. It's like, oh wow, I'm surprised that this guy hasn't cracked yet. But you know, I've been surprised before, and they all cave in at the end, and like you know, those kinds of things. It's like super fascinating and also super intense to read because he, Joe does not pull back on a lot of the. Details in these torture scenes, no. and I think that's rightfully so because you need to understand exactly to what extent Glockta goes in his torturing to get the full perspective of his character. That you do, and something I was trying to keep an eye on here is when we do get the gruesome details you're describing there of Glockta torturing other people. Why is it that he is? arguably the most beloved character <laughs> in the first law. I mean, it's it's between... It's... Uh, I don't want to say neck and neck, but it's uh, between... <laughs> it's between Glockta and Logan for who's the most like beloved character in the first law. I think that's pretty fair to say. And I'm like, this guy is just out there torturing people so I was trying to keep an eye on what what is Abercrombie doing here. And I think the first thing that we get from Glockta is this chronic pain stuff that you were mentioning, Charles. And I think it's like right away we can empathize with that. Like all of us know what pain feels like and it sucks to be someone. My biggest enemy stares. (laughs) Right. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And, Abercrombie from the first chapter, he leans really hard on that. Like we feel for someone who can't walk downstairs without terrible pain. It makes us reflect on like maybe with some gratitude if if we happen to be able to walk downstairs without feeling any pain, then that's something to be grateful about. And I think that it, uh, yeah, Abercrombie's constantly referencing things that are accessible to a large portion of the population. Like he says, uh, at one moment that something is like stubbing a toe and waiting for the pain to kick in. So these moments that it's like a lot of us have experienced stubbing our toes. Um, 
and right. we can say, oh, that, like, oh, no, not that moment. Yeah, he almost and, falls down the stairs and catches himself. Yeah. It's very ungraceful, unseemly, yeah. So there's a lot that we can pretty, we should, you'd think that most of us wouldn't be able to relate to a torturer, but right away it's like all these experiences that a lot of us have. And then even when he's he's torturing Ruse to start with, he generally seems to want Ruse to confess sooner rather than later. It's a little bit more like the way he views torture. He doesn't enjoy it. Um, he doesn't. He questions why he does it constantly. Uh, but it's kind of this detached curiosity that mm-hmm. seems to come from more yes. of like his own anhedonia and his nihilism. But he never takes pleasure in it. And it's kind of the same way he views his own fate is with that nihilism in Anhedonia where it's like, well, he's not looking at this person getting tortured and not feeling anything because he's malicious or evil. He's doing it because he just doesn't care about anything because he's experienced so much torture himself. And that, again, is something that we can relate to as just being such a broken person. Uh, or maybe we can't directly, but we can understand what it would be like to go through so much to be such a broken person. You can't even ca- you can't care about anyone else's fate because you don't care about your own, and that's juxtaposed against Giselle, who like his own fate is so important to him. Everything that happens to him is so so important, and everything that happens to everyone else is so unimportant. And I think it's like that that makes it so much harder to empathize with Giselle than it is to empathize with Glockta. Well said. I love that idea of his detached curiosity because that's so true. Like when he's torturing people, he's always like, oh, why do I do this? Oh, it's interesting how the body does that. Oh, it's interesting how he's holding out. Oh, it's interesting how when Frost slaps him and he falls over, the chair doesn't move. How does that happen? You know, he's always like musing on these other things. He doesn't enjoy the violence he's not like the bloody nine where he's just craving blood and he's after blood and he can't wait to kill the next person or torture the next person mm. he's not like a, he it's very procedural and he's approaching it he's focusing on these outside little curiosity details about the human spirit and body and and just the idea of torturing to get information, you know, he's always kind of musing on those things. And that's kind of what makes him a little more likable. Like if he was like, oh, it felt so good to see his former friend suffer because he forgot about him. And then like, how can I make him suffer more? You know, it, it's not like that. It's just like, oh, I'm curious how he's still kind of holding on. Or, oh, curious how when he was hit, the chair didn't budge. What's up with that? You know, like those kinds of things. And that's what makes him so interesting. It's so fun to read and a bit more likable. Right, and as we talked about other characters already is Abercrombie does this thing where he makes the character so well-rounded. It's like Glockta, for example, he's uh, he has this moment with West toward the end of the blade itself where West comes and uh, it, like wants him to look at, wants Glockta to look after his sister and then they have this conversation where Glockta's like, you didn't even come to see me. We were friends, all this kind of thing. And then Wes is like, I came twice, dude. Uh, (laughs) And your mom kept turning me away. And Glockta, the guy who questions everything, uh, I mean, (laughs) everything, he has this moment where it's like, the one thing I never thought to question was this thing well, that no I came believed to visit. <laughs> that West, yeah, that no one came to visit. And West especially, who he knew had a little bit more going on than just liking him because of all the superficial stuff. And right. it's like, it, it rounds out who Glockta is by doubling down on this. Like, he has so much self loathing and feels so bad for himself and he's so depressed that it's like what's the one thing he doesn't question that everyone around him hates him too much to visit him yeah or is horrified and, to see him or, or is horrified disgusted by him. him or whatever right Artie comes in and she's one of those characters that I, I think we have a few of them that kind of just like sees through what is being presented on the outside from a character. And that's so important. Like, Glockta is someone who sees through what's going on on the outside with a character. It's why, like, the same thing that Artie is able to see 
through Giselle, who's beautiful on the outside, but <laughs> <laughs> ugly on the inside, and, uh, uh, and say, like, this guy is contemptible, but at least it's entertaining to spend time with him. Um, and then see with Glockta, okay, yeah, this guy's a torturer, and he's obviously gone through a lot with all of the torture he's been through, but say, like, there's something more going on there, and she's at least willing to give him a chance. Right. I how, think speaks a lot to Artie as a character. Right, and how Abercrombie-esque is it that the character that's most accepting and like understanding is also the one that couldn't care any less or the most indifferent character you know she's the one that's like oh whatever no one pays attention to me yeah. like I, i'm talking to you because i'm <laughs> bored and like i don't really care what you have going on because i'm so bored and hollow that it doesn't matter <laughs> it's like that's very abercrombie of like then that's the character that's the most accepting it's not the one that just is full of love and is trying to make everyone feel around. better yeah it's like oh glock to cheer up buddy like people should be more tolerant of you she's just like you seem interesting just because I'm so dead inside that anything that is interest like is different is interesting to me and if it piques my curiosity I'm like invested as as a piece of her. I right. think she's also genuinely interested in Glockta as well like as a person but she's also just so indifferent and like kind of numb that she's just like rolling with it as well. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense and She's also one of the only characters to have a pretty normal, not too prejudiced exchange with Logan yeah, for similar reasons. Too. It was yeah, a short lived conversation. Like, They're just like, we have nothing in common to talk about here. <laughs> <laughs> the conversation did not last very long. <laughs> no, it did not last very long, but there was none of the like none of the discrimination that comes with Logan's interactions with almost everyone else when he's in the Agrion. So give Artie credit there. Yes. And she's probably also more used to Northmen given uh, where she's, she's from. from. That's true. Anglin. Yeah. But yeah. So I think there's, uh, there's so much to Glockta though, that uh, is left to talk about. I think that mm. he's, I don't know. He he's so he's so interesting in his internal monologue. Like he they do I think the way that Abercrombie uses those like italics, you know what I'm talking about, which is basically to symbolize like, okay, this is directly what Glockta is thinking now. Right. And he always juxtaposes the italics of what Glockta's actually thinking right next to these pieces of dialogue where Glockta will, like, directly contradict yeah. that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> or I, sometimes he'll, like, talk to a character, and then he'll be like, how soon until, like, I'm the guy that's going to be dead? Or, like, when is my body going to turn up for messing with this guy, you know? Or, or things like that. Like, right. It's very funny. Like, he's always like, I'm playing a dangerous game here, and you know what? I'm probably going to be the next one to die. Like, why wouldn't I be? Yeah, and he gets himself embroiled in all of these really dangerous situations that are really interesting to read about. And it's the kind of stuff that only someone who basically was being driven more by that detached curiosity that we were talking about, Charles, than any sense of self-preservation would get themselves into. And we as readers have the benefit of a detached curiosity oftentimes uh, where, you know, we're not in any real danger when any of these events are playing out. So it's fun to be able to be in a character's head who's like, yeah, I'm going to go in there and check out what's going on with this mystery because, yeah, I, I could die and maybe other characters would avoid it because of that, but I'm I'm not really worried about dying. Yeah. He's like, oh, I, arrest I the most powerful person in the guild? That's probably right. going to make some enemies but hey let's see where it goes kind of a thing is is very interesting um i will yeah, also just give a shout out to, to the looking. yeah we, we, what is he looking forward to found in bulk oh yes he's even yeah, he's even willing to look into found in bulk which was like our director was like dude it's like it's is funny like, do it's not just, yeah. he's like ah, oh, no it's not, probably not important this that he tells this whole story where it's like okay <laughs> like, mm -hmm. what it's like 
okay, that's going to be an interesting thing to try and remember. But I want to just give credit real quick while we're talking about Glockta and his juxtaposition of his inner di- dialogue to his actual dialogue. The narrator sure. of the audiobook, Stephen Pacey, does a really interesting... He has like a like a lispy accent for when he yeah. uses Glockta's speaking voice and then Glockta's internal voice is almost like the before he was tortured, like more of this like high noble accent kind of thing, which is really interesting to see back and forth because you get this I this the sense that Glock that was is two people. He's this battered body and then he's also this conniving person. And it comes through in the audiobooks with the choice to do two different voices because it almost is two different voices. It's like this was the man that I like all the stuff I'm holding on to, and this is the reality I'm forced to deal with. You know, it's super interesting in the audiobook to to read it as two voices. For sure, and Stephen Pacey is incredible. I've I've done reading it physically and in, in now multiple forms, Kindle <laughs> uh, book, and uh, now I've and I've also listened to audiobook. And Stephen Pacey is phenomenal. Yes, I mean. They, they they just don't make him like Stephen Pacey, Charles. <laughs> that guy. <laughs> say what you say. One thing about Stephen Pacey: say he's a good audiobook narrator. <laughs> yeah, well, it's the only thing I know about Stephen Pacey. <laughs> so, if I had to say one thing, it'd probably be that. <laughs> so, yeah. What's interesting is kind of how the story is structured. Is you kind of get these POV characters for the first half of the book separately, but. You get a payoff in the second half when they all come together. And for me, like we kind of talked about this moment a little bit of when Glockta is interrogating everybody like Baez and Logan and 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 he speaks with Jazal and like the second half of this book where they're all together and Baez has brought the crew uh, into the city and they're trying to navigate each other. And we finally see everybody starting to interact and it's like a second experience in this book it's it's truly fascinating (laughs) yeah for sure charles i mean even just what we're talking about there with like when logan is meeting Artie, let's say a and it's like oh whoa these two i didn't know we'd get that or then logan's interacting with west is another column west i should say Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh you get to again get these moments where characters are like simultaneously developed like uh, logan is being developed at the same time as column is being developed in the sense that uh, column can see again past the superficial with logan of just like this is some guy from the north comes from a little further north and has had more interactions and even while logan is pulling some of your favorite fish out water type stuff and he's trying to eat the flowers (laughs) at the table when he's seated next to west you have west who's like look yeah of course he's trying to eat the flowers because he like this is so foreign to him he'd have no idea yeah he's like i don't think those are for eating and then he's like how did it taste (laughs) yeah (laughs) all that funny stuff yeah (laughs) right but west is also willing to say like hey well you might not know about this but you have some sort of experience that could be valuable and he's just kind of picking his brain he's like oh do you know bethod and logan knows a lot about bethod (laughs) (laughs) so uh, then he's giving Calm all this really great military, like strategic advice, and Calm doesn't care what he looks like or how many flowers he eats. He's willing <laughs> to hear all of that, and I think to to bring Calm into the forefront a little bit, who I, I think is one of the m- most interesting character. I mean, it's a tough it's a tough crowd to stand out among with such a, amazing characters, but Calm, another I think like underrated character in the mix here. He is of arguably, especially like early on, the person that's easiest to see as a like seemingly more standard, like nice or heroic, or seems strong, lawful but, good uh, kind of. Well, yeah, sure, lawful good maybe is what maybe you think he good. is, or yeah, neutral good, right? Like that's and how... I mean, look. Well, yeah, there's no need to bury the lead. Where the reason Charles and I are being a little bit like, uh, I don't know if Calm's a 
good dude is because the moment he has with Artie that uh, Charles was implying earlier where he uh, like chokes her and uh, he beats her, gets violent with her, he hits her too, uh, is really tragic. In a lot of ways, it's playing out these familial relationships that you can tell have already played out with her with their parents yeah their, it's their well. it's really an exceptional example of dialogue and telling a backstory through dialogue and in such an honest way and also such a way that makes you feel sad and you know we've seen Wes like he gets headaches when he's frustrated right. and he's you like you don't necessarily see the signs that he's battling an anger issue but you get the sense that maybe he's you know clearly he's showing some signs of having an anger problem and you might not perceive that right away because he's like always on the right end of what he's trying to do and he's got a sympathetic background of like pulled up he's like the only one in the city that's pulled himself up by his own bootstraps you know he's like the only one that earned his place and so he's just trying to exist in a world where everyone is like prejudiced and privileged and all that so you can sympathize with that being frustrating so when he's like talking to someone and they're saying some like privileged obnoxious stuff and he's like oh my headache and he's, you're like i i empathize with you but what you don't realize until you get to this moment with Artie, and this is such a great example of again showing over telling of like we have no idea what his backstory really was we knew that he was an upstart and would do anything to get ahead but it's through this conversation that we realized he like hey when you left you left me behind and you left me with dad and dad was abusive and you knew that when you left and you know then you see Wes who now has this anger problem it's like the cycle continues and he lashes out at her and she's drinking she's drunk she's also shows signs of abuse and like all this comes down in this one super dramatic almost like out of nowhere like where did this beautiful piece almost reads like a stage play c- come from and and like how amazing it was written and i just that scene always sticks out to me i'm like this is the best scene of dialogue in this book by a long shot just so so well written for sure charles that chapter is called nobody's dog and what one part of it stuck out to me is after all this has played out uh, it's uh, uh there's one hand reached out to her then he jerked it back afraid of what it might do i'm sorry he was always sorry. Don't you remember? Like, yeah, that's right. That uh, column is the one who says, I'm sorry. And then Artie says, he was always sorry. Don't you remember? Yeah. Which is like... The implication of that speaks so more to anything you could tell us as an author. Right. And uh, yeah, Abercrombie doesn't need any flashbacks or anything like that. He can just have those <laughs> little moments. And he can get across so much about these characters and their history. And it's like, and and again, it's like Abercrombie knows when to go all in, but he also knows when to pull back just a little bit. And it's like, isn't it so much worse that it's like West is apologizing? Yeah, he knows he did wrong, but it's like this awful father that they have. Like, he wasn't just this vicious person who beat them and didn't care for them ever at all it's like yeah he said he was sorry too and then he'd do it again and that west is repeating those kind of actions and almost enacting this like intergenerational trauma yeah this cycle of abuse almost yeah yes is so much it cuts so much deeper than would something that was a little more one-dimensional like oh yeah our father was a real jerk who never said he was sorry it's like no it's worse because he would and then you do it again right and it's not even so much about the dad as it is about the fallout from it and now here's two people Artie and and Colm who uh have both clearly been affected by that and we're not realizing that until this moment and then it's progressed to another level where Colm actually hits already and it's just like so um intense in that moment yeah it's 
brutal. And, and it's it built so well, the Charles. Scene I know, is like shot for shot of Colum, like yeah, just just hurting Artie, and you're, you're like, whoa, like you 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 kind of don't see it coming, but you kind of do at the same time. It's like this is an extreme thing for Wes, but it's been something that's been bubbling and brooding the whole book that it has and you get you get moments that definitely tell you he's capable of these kind of things but it's very intentionally been told and not shown to this point and that's like from Giselle's perspective who we're always like okay well take everything that this guy says with a grain of salt uh he has a reflection that's like well he'd always heard that column had quite the temper but he never thought it'd be turned on him and so there's that kind of moment and you're like okay Giselle like you you say a lot of things and like 10% of it reflects reality in some way <laughs> so then it's a little hint and definitely rereading you get to be like, Oh yeah. Like that's right there. Um, and you get these other moments. I think even like earlier in the chapter when Colm's starting to get those headaches and stuff, he has that rough way of treating the other no the, the nobleman who is at the same level as him. Right. So it's been building toward it. And I think we've also been building toward it with, Abercrombie intentionally having Colum be the one guy who appears to be more of a like good person, and he's definitely trying. He's like constantly when he meets Pharaoh. That's another moment where we get some like uh, meeting of the worlds yeah. here, where it's like, okay, what would it be like to be this person right now is what Colm's thinking when he sees Pharaoh and she's basically threatening to kill people and he's able right. to d- diffuse that situation. So we we know he's trying and we think maybe this guy is our guy to root for. Right. I mean, and empathy is so rare in this world and Colm West is one of the few that practices it with everyone that he sees and we feel for him in that way and we also like him because he is an upstart kind of guy he succeeded where no one else could he did it all on his own merit so you have respect for that but you know in Abercrombie fashion it's like is it almost worse that a guy is trying to be nice but he's really an angry person like like what like how how does this moment shake our opinion of Colin West you know it's tough. Yeah. I mean, I've heard people say like, and then we find out he's the worst of any of them. And I don't know if I would go that far. Like, yeah, he's but not it's, turning something into the more bloody e- nine for Pete's sakes. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. And well, we should, uh, that's definitely a conversation that I, I'd like to have. Is, so we talked about Logan, but we didn't talk about the bloody nine. And, I know. We have uh, so much to get to. Yeah. <laughs> I know. So, yeah, I'll just say, look, we've got plenty more time to talk about these characters because we've got two more we've got before they are hanged in the last argument of kings coming right. up, and we can even do more. So uh, the last bit on Column, I think, is uh, he's complex like all these other characters like people are, and I think that's what Abercrombie's point in the blade itself is with him is like no i'm like yeah maybe you think this is the one guy who's like the nice guy in the group but it's like people are people and they're complex and they they have good things about them and bad things about them and i'm not giving you anyone who's just a straightforward hero very well said um so where do we want to pick up on the story here is there what are these last pieces we want to bring up before we take it home well should we like discuss pharaoh and the dog man as well as yeah we can go through characters. those quickly i feel like look the situation of this whole book is that you have the union which is getting attacked both in the north by bethod and then in the south by the gurkish and so i think what the dog man does is give you more context of what's going on in the north and and then pharaoh gives you a little context of what it's like in the south and you know there's also this other piece to Pharaoh that Baez is kind of hinting at that we're not sure, but like uh, Baez and is it Yulwe, um are talking and they say that, oh, she might 
there's something special about her or whatever. And so that's kind of interesting. But that that's how I saw them in this book of like just providing a little extra context to the greater um, to the greater world outside of the Union to understand the two threats that are simultaneously coming in. That's fair, Charles. I mean, I think you're doing the Dogman dirty a, a little bit there. I think <laughs> he's like, fun he's, to read. Like I love learning. I love all the cast of those that band of Northmen. You know, they're all super interesting. And it's again this idea of showing over telling, where like they're like right when we see them, they're fighting over who's in charge and what to do. And they somehow through their own, you know, they're not quote civilized, but they do have a very effective way of like putting aside their differences and coming together. And it's, it's hard to think of, of anyone like black Dow getting along with anybody, but they somehow get it together and they're highly effective. And it's fun to see that where it's like, Oh, it's so easy to think that these are barbarians but they have their way of doing things and their experience is having them like run circles around the union. So it's, it's interesting to to read those. I'm just, you know, they're not as a critical to the plot. If there even is a story that's critical to the plot in this book, but yeah, yeah. I love the dog man for sure. I don't want to feel like I'm doing him dirty. Don't do the dog man dirty, Charles. <laughs> He's yeah. I mean, I think he is, an interesting character that maybe gives us some his chapters i think give us some realism to these fight scenes that you rarely get in any novel like that's an abercrombie thing in general is that fight scenes are full of tripping and like mishaps and all this kind of stuff that would actually happen if you were in a fight but I think fantasy novels have a tendency sometimes to go more cinematic. Yeah, more epic, yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, it's like people don't go around like tripping and falling over themselves in Brandon Sanderson's fight scenes. And, and both <laughs> or in Lord Abercrombie of the Rings. <laughs> and, or Lord of the Rings, sure. Lord of the Rings, you're so far above the fight scene that it's like, uh, anyway, I won't. <laughs> <laughs> but... <laughs> Point being, Brandon Sanderson and Abercrombie both write like incredible fight scenes, but Brett Sanderson goes for the things that would make these incredible moments in like an anime or a movie or something very cinematic. And Abercrombie goes for this like, well, is it real though? Like, is this how this would actually happen? And people are always like missing their, <laughs> missing their shots and falling right. over themselves. So I think Dogman, and he always has to take a piss before every fight which i think is a fun little thing is like you never imagine that but it's like what makes these characters feel so much like people is like uh, yeah of course the dog man is someone who although he's this name man is like oh god i gotta take a piss yeah. right he always has to pee right before the action which is a funny funny really specific detail um yeah no i think they yeah they bring a great you know color and it's kind of breaks up everything that's going on in the union as well it's good pacing it's it's like a little spice on top of the dish you know the dog man scenes yeah and pharaoh a little more the least probably the least popular character from this I, I I was able to get a little more appreciation now for reading it this time than I have in the past, but uh, probably no one wants to hear us go on and on about Pharaoh. So uh, if you do, then you know tweet at us at the Shh, FDF podcast. I'm sure one, she'll and, come uh, back. I'll chat Pharaoh with you. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I guess like the only other person we would be remiss to not talk about, and maybe it'll help bring it all home, is the great Baez himself. First of the Magi. First of the Magi. Of course. Right. And so, yeah, where every character goes through growth and is interacting with each other, um, Baez remains unchanged and unamused. He He's the force of nature that knows everything and is driving the whole situation. And it's so fun to read him kind of managing everybody and... Uh, like when he's crossed, how mad he gets, you know, these little things about him that you're like, something's going on with this Baez character. And he's really super interesting when you consider all the like tropes of fantasy that like Baez is coming in and, and 
like totally breaking all of those. He's not a character you'd find in Lord of the Rings at all. <laughs> right, but it feels like he's pretty he's pretty deliberately what happens when Joe Abercrombie writes a Gandalf type. Yes, right. Like 100%. we so easily can slot him into like, oh, it's Gandalf. Like every book needs a good Gandalf. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and Abercrombie is like, sure, I'll give you this uh this elderly wizard type who's a, like supposed been around for centuries and uh you know puts fellowships together, and <laughs> uh, we get, we have him as pretty much a force that gathers everyone together. And he, you can tell, has a particular use for everyone he's gathering. We get a little bit of, like, Pharaoh overhearing Baez's conversation, and he's got some plots. But we were introduced to him in a way that always sticks out to me. Right. Where we get this moment where at first... Uh, it's like we're expecting the Magi, uh, or like the we're in Logan's the POV. We're in Logan's POV, and Logan Logan mistakes I think a couple people for bias before he yeah. actually he goes to every person in a robe with a long beard and is like, "Oh, hi, bias," <laughs> and they're like, "What? I'm not bias," <laughs> because they look like traditional wizards. I think is like the right, is especially what... one of them. I think it's like the person in charge of the library. It's like right. exactly what you'd expect a wizard to look like. And he's like, here's the guy. Yeah. And it was actually this guy that Logan thought was a butcher. <laughs> like already Logan had seen the person. It was like, oh, there's the, there's some butcher. <laughs> and it's just some bald headed dude. And then that guy's like, the guy turns out to be Bias, who's this legendary first of the Magi. It's always That's a very right. interesting introduction. And it's interesting also, I can tell that Joe Abercrombie had this thought experiment of like, what if you had the powers of Gandalf, right? Where you understood everything and you've been around for a really long time and you could do incredible things and you had basically a force of nature as a power. You would probably, you know, not be amused by people at all. You'd probably be like, I don't have, like, you are so a lower level. I basically... Um, am not interested. <laughs> you know, he's just like, I know what's best for you. Trust me, and kind of drags them along. It's like, oh, you don't need to know. It's because it's not your business. You know, like all these kinds of things that make him seem a little more abrasive. He's got a bit of a short fuse when it comes to being patient or maybe like having a temper. He's also very. He's like, you talk to me that way. I'm biased. Who do you think you're talking to? You know, so it's like all these like really funny isms about bias that's so contradict like Gandalf is like oh I love all creatures <laughs> and th they're what makes me so happy and bias is like doing his own thing you know <laughs> it's really interesting to see that right bias he seems to be able to at will bounce back and forth from fitting the role of a little bit more of this like Gandalf type when right. he feels he needs to be, we're not in his point of view, so we don't really know what's going on in his head. Mm -hmm. uh, though that would be something I'd love to <laughs> yeah. see one day. That's that like a awesome. short story, <laughs> Yeah, but uh, it's like, I'd love a short story. Joe. <laughs> <laughs> we need if to get listening. in the mind of Which you definitely aren't. <laughs> um, so we, <laughs> I, I would love that so much to get in Baez's head. But I think that's like behind the curtain. If you're in Baez's head, it's uh, uh, there's a lot that you don't, you know, he's supposed to be this mysterious first of the Magi. So it's good that we're not in his head here. And we, but we get the sense that Baez wants to appear a little bit more gandalf -y at times, he's even willing to dress up in right. how people would expect a Gandalf type to show right. up. Because like, this is what Bias is supposed to look like. Yeah, there's that so moment where they, the before, yeah, the costume shop. I love that. Where it's like right before they address the court, you know, they're like, we need to stop somewhere first. He's like, get me the, and then Logan's like, these clothes are very impractical and uncomfortable and <laughs> silly and makes me feel ridiculous. And, you know, he's, he's got, Bias has, and Kwai have these long wizard robes and Logan's wearing the like furry leather armor. It's like theater troupe costumes. And it's, 
and then the yeah. the the crowd like buys into it immediately you know so it's just like yeah i'm just kind of pandering to these people just because it's easier to look the part than it is to you know try and be how we normally are you know <laughs> which is so funny exactly and there are these moments Charles, where you do see what you're talking about, too, where he is very impatient about the fact that he he is biased and he we know already as readers pretty early on, like, oh, this guy is legit using magic like this is bias. Yeah. And then he arrives at the union and he's like a figure that may or may not existed from history in their eyes. And he's <laughs> got to like jump through all of these hoops in order to regain his seat on the closed cancel. And he does see everyone as being very ungrateful for a person yeah. who's played a critical yeah. role <laughs> in setting up their entire government. So we get to see that side you're talking about, Charles, where there's a little bit of frustration from <laughs> yeah. bias toward his... Yeah, because like the generations goals. of humanity are very short. So it's like all these things they're enjoying are like the direct result of bias and no one seems to know. And to, not only do they not seem to know, but they're giving them all this grief at the same time. It's like, what are you talking about? We've always had this. We're proud people. We've done... And he's like, what? <laughs> so that's <laughs> always uh, a fun piece of the story to, to go back to. Yeah, and the one person who's probably most suspicious of Charles is another, none other than Pharaoh. <laughs> yeah, yes. she's just about suspicious of everyone. But we do have these Pharaoh moments in the blade itself, where she she's kind of looking around and she's seeing like Kwai, and she's like, "Okay, he's no threat. Like, you gotta keep an eye on everyone." But if there's ever someone not to keep an eye on, it's this guy. <laughs> and yeah. then she's looking at Logan and she's like, okay, I can just see in the way this guy moves. He's ridiculously dangerous. And then d despite how dangerous she perceives Logan as, she looks at Baez and she's like, there's something with this guy that I just do not trust. And if I have to kill someone here, I'm killing this guy first, no matter <laughs> how dangerous Pharaoh, that like, oh, can I <laughs> Gotta kill Bias quick, first and quick. <laughs> it's like, okay, Pharaoh, <laughs> whatever you say. <laughs> Vengeance, Charles. So, yeah, it, Pharaoh also punches Bias, which is pretty, I, I think, pretty bold when we think about everything 100%. that Bias can do. I mean, he yeah. bursts someone, right? He just made someone who's coming at him pop, basically. Yeah, turns him a, a and bloody he can shoot mist. fire. Yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> and he can shoot fire, all this kind of stuff, and Pharaoh freaking punches him. <laughs> His pretty uh interesting moment no one else really has dared do that to bias yeah and bias kind of laughs it off right he's like oh yes you're who i'm looking for <laughs> well bias has these moments with pharaoh where it's like at first he is you get these like pharaoh noticed a flash of something like dark across bias's face right. but then bias turned all of a sudden kindly yeah. and was doing his little game. like it's basically like <laughs> That is bias, right? It's <laughs> yeah. like he's trying to get what he's trying to get done, and he is having these moments where it's like something's off there, something's beneath this, and then you get these like, oh, it's better for me to be a Gandalf type right now, so I'm going to be a Gandalf type, right? If that's going to help me, right, right, exactly. He he's willing to play the part to to get what he wants, and um. He's super good at working that. And Pharaoh is the most likely to see through all that stuff because she's very much like binary, like like hate or don't care. <laughs> so um, she cuts through all the BS sometimes. And it's interesting to see her interactions with Baez and, the, and those kinds of things. Yeah. No, it's... It's going to be an interesting ride here, Charles. We pretty much end up with Baez having gathered his little fellowship. Yes. And uh, <laughs> the fellowship is basically Baez, Kwai, Logan, Jazal, and Pharaoh, much to Jazal's chagrin. <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's not happy. Right. There's to also be Brother Longfoot as well, the guy. Oh, yes. Cannot forget. 
the ever talented brother Longfoot. <laughs> One of his many talents is hiding, yeah. and he uh, hid. He must have hid from me when I was recalling <laughs> those characters. Well said. <laughs> so yeah, so they're they're off to go f- uh, on some sort of adventure here, Charles. And we're used some to fellowships sort. in right. We're used to fellowships in fantasy, so I'm sure all will go just standard fantasy fellowship style yep. right yep i'm sure the the good will defeat the evil and all that i'm sure they'll go on many adventures and quests and all kinds of exciting things will happen <laughs> <laughs> well said and otherwise we've got glockta heading off uh, to defend a city against the Gurkish. Superior of Dagaska. S- Superior of Dagaska, yeah. So Dagaska is a border city that is in trouble here yep. because the Feeling Gurkish the heat are from the Gurkish, more more. yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So and good then luck, Glockta. We've got the other side. <laughs> yeah, good luck, Glockta. And uh, we've also got the other side up north where we'll have eyes from Column West, from the Dogman. Yep. And. We're excited. Yep, the stage is set, Dylan. Stage is set. The pieces are on Let's the board. See what happens. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right. Uh, any parting words on the first law before we bring it home? Oh, we didn't talk about the bloody nine, Charles. The the bloody nine. Yes, of course. It's almost like a total writing style shift once Logan yeah. gets in the thick of battle, and it starts with like, "Oh no, I thought you were gone." Please, <laughs> and then the perspective just total tonal shift into the bloody nine, where he's just like reveling in the gore and the violence, and he's looking for more people to kill and. There's that moment where he's like, and then there's another person where the voice in the back of his head said not to hurt, but he didn't care. He was the bloody nine, you know? So it's like, he's that's him yeah. like wanting to kill a Pharaoh. So it's like, you know how unhinged he is. It's almost like split personality disorder. That'd be a dissociative identity disorder, Charles. Thank you. So yeah, the bloody nine, it's very interesting because throughout the book, we... We get acquainted with Logan, and he keeps telling us how many horrible things he's done. And we've gotten to see when push comes to shove, he does have to be realistic about these things. We know you can never have too many knives and all that. And he's willing to, he's killed people during the blade itself. So we know he's willing to do that, but we've never seen him do anything in cold blood, really, to this point. We've heard him Mm -hmm. talk about doing it. And then he. He ends up in this dire strait situation, and he ends up feeling a little something creeping up. Uh, there's the lead into it is so great, Charles. It's uh, there's all things come to an end, but some only lie still, forgotten. There is a cold feeling in Logan's stomach, a feeling he hadn't felt for a long time. No, he whispered, "I'm free of you," but it was too late, too late. And then it goes right into that total tonal shift where just the way the Bloody Nine sees the world is so different from the way that Logan sees the world. And he's just wants nothing more than blood. And at least to this point, I won't spoil what we do or don't know from anything later on in the first law. Uh, I'll say, like, we have no idea exactly what's going on. It does feel like maybe it's a second personality that comes out. We also know there's a lot of magical elements in this world, but there's something inside Logan that when it takes control, he wants nothing but to basically kill and but there's these great it's interesting these like metaphors or maybe not metaphors but uh, just the way that he compares like what it's like to do something with the bloody nine there and i'll grab one quote which is like uh one of the northmen that he's fighting against or one a northman that he's fighting against who's one of the practicals Mm -hmm. They try to like bear hug him basically to <laughs> <laughs> take him down. And it says, an awful mistake. Better to embrace the burning fire. <laughs> it's yeah. like, that's how messed up the bloody nine is. And they just headbutts that guy to into oblivion basically. So <laughs> it's some pretty 
savage stuff that yeah, it's some we pretty, do. Yeah, it's some it's some pretty graphic violence. Um, I think you know it was kind of fun, but it's also very alarming. Be- and like the total difference in just the writing style of the voice is totally different from Logan Nine Fingers to the Bloody Nine. You know, they are very distinct characters. Right. The man screamed and screamed behind his mask, and the Bloody Nine laughed and twisted the blade. Logan might have pitied him, but Logan was far away, and the Bloody Nine had no more pity in him than the winter, less even. Mm. Like, that's the kind of... Yeah. That's interesting. (laughs) So, we we get a little glimpse into what the Bloody Nine is like, and we don't know yet what role he will or won't play moving forward, but... For it's now, it's one of the, I guess, twists at the end. Yes, uh, it seems to be like it's like it the twist. rising action, right? It's like the most exciting thing to happen in a while in terms of like fighting, and it's also almost, almost kind of like a reveal. Like he's been like everyone kind of whispers like, "Wow, the bloody nine, he's a, like Logan Nine Fingers, he's a legend," and uh, right, and you haven't seen that. You only know this like gentle philosopher guy and then now you see it like the legend come to life you know of what he's capable of where he's even going to kill pharaoh you know he's like that's who we're dealing with here and then then it goes away and it's like is it gonna come back the next time they're in danger like is the, like what's happening here like, is anyone safe around this guy like you just don't know yeah it's a tough sitch for logan you gotta yeah. carry the bloody nine around everywhere and then the other thing that it raises for us is a question about this bloody past of Logan's. Is it something that he can be... Does he have agency almost, over it? Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Like exculpated or is it something that he... Like how many of these atrocities were him and how many of these were the bloody nine? And depending on that answer then how much can we fault or blame Logan for these it's things? true. So, we, yeah, we've got a lot left to explore around that in the next couple books or so. And I'm looking forward to exploring that with you, Dylan. <sighs> Nothing better than exploring the world of the first law with my buddy, Charles. I know. I'm so excited we're here. I had such a fun time reading this. It was my second read-through, and... It was like I was reading it for the first time. You know, it, it, it's so fun. And Abercrombie's voice is so unique and so funny. And just, it's a great book for fantasy fans to pick up because it does such a good such a good job in the genre. Right. I mean, the Abercrombie just narrative voice is unlike any one else's voice in the genre and it's so unique and it's so just compelling to yeah. and it's read, like alive it's very fun and witty and active and right. entertaining and drives this like very show over tell and it's like super super good Br- brimming with character. so tight to perspective yes. and and it doesn't matter how different the perspective is Abercrombie finds a way to write that perspective in a way that feels both truthful and ridiculously entertaining. Yes. It's like, it, no matter what, he's you're in for a good ride with any character in The First Law or anything Abercrombie writes. Yep, say one thing about Joe Abercrombie. Say he, his books are a good ride. <laughs> Well said, Charles. Thank you. And with that, I think I'm going to bring us out of here. All right, everybody. Thank you for listening to yet another very exciting episode of the Friends Talking Fantasy Podcast. If you liked what you heard today, do us a favor. Jump onto social media. Go onto Twitter. Tweet at us at the FTF Podcast with a number one at the end. If you prefer Facebook or Instagram, that's fine. You can reach out to us at the FTF Podcast. If you want to send us an email, if that's what you like to do, do so, please, to us at the FTF Podcast podcast at gmail.com now now dylan if they are on apple Podcasts and they want to show some support uh what can they do 
false five stars to our podcast. You know, just scroll down a little bit on our little podcast page and look where there are those five stars. They're probably blank. Um, (laughs) What you can do is fill in five of them and you can even write a review if you have the time. That's right. We'll we'll take the five stars if that's all you have time for. We know you're busy. Come on. Yes. Well, we know you're busy, but thank you for your time. (laughs) Thank you for your support. And as always... Go forth and conquer, friends.